Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. We're in week three of Sagalong 2022, Eggle Saga, chapters 45 through 66. And I'm very excited because this is the portion of Eggle Saga that I think really pushes the idea that this saga in particular and a number of the other Icelandic sagas really belong in that dis discussion among the masterpieces of world literature. That Eggle Saga is a work that, that deserves and rewards close and attentive reading. Um, and I think the real strength of Eggle Saga, as we discover in this week's reading, is that there's a character at its center, not just an archetype, not just this um, you know, historical biographical figure, not someone who is supposed to represent an idea that this idealized uh, quester, as we see in other prose or epic works of, of this time period, we have a, a, a character who feels human. Yes, he's a historical personage, but he seems to grow, he seems to develop. He's not made of cardboard. He feels much closer to a human. And as a result, I find this portion of Echo Saga starts to make me feel like we're, we're, we're getting much closer to our modern idea of the novel. And um, so that has been really interesting, really enjoyable. I want to focus on Egil, on his character and his character's development and where we see that revealed in this video. And then talk about a couple of different like um, parallels that we've seen to other weeks or, or to um, components that are going on, uh, rather than just sort of summarize the events. Wikipedia can do that better than I can. <laughs> so let's talk about Egil. We left off, he was this overgrown brute who's incredibly violent, horrifyingly violent, uh, and he can spit verses with the best of them. His verses generally used to just taunt everybody. Uh, he's wildly unpleasant. And most of that holds true in this portion of the saga. Uh, he's still an incredible warrior, might makes right. He's still generally unpleasant. Like, there's very few people who want to spend time with him except other raiders. Uh, and even then, it's just a handful of raiders. Um, but we, and he still can taunt very well, but we start to notice a couple of shifts. Egil's poetry is not purely taunting now. It's not purely bragging now. It has other purposes. Egil himself is willing to be humble. He's willing to use his words uh, to save his neck. When he's shipwrecked and presented at York to King Eric and Queen Gunhild, his longtime enemies, who he's, he's killed his son, he has, uh, you know, killed multiple family members, he's killed the queen's brother, he has wronged this family and been wronged by this family so many times, and really uh, extending a feud that has existed for a couple of generations now, that there's no reason they shouldn't kill him if he's in their power. And yet they, they plead, Egil and, and um, his, his friend plead for his life, and he uses his poetry <clears throat> to save his life. He constructs, rather than this long, taunting, vicious, you know, slam poem, <laughs> he constructs this long, beautiful lyric poem that honors a king that he himself really does has not honored throughout his entire life. He has, you know, resisted and rebuked throughout his entire life, and here he is using his poetry, which is really his special gift. It's not just his, his brutality and his power. It's his poetry that really is, is Egil's special gift. And he's using that now to honor this king that in his life he's never honored. And so that's fascinating. It's fascinating to see that development. Um, and the reason I say that, that I don't find Egil's strength and, and his skill as a warrior to be his special gift is because it's never noted that he's a shape changer like the others. Now, there's a hint. There's a hint in that whole uh, business about there's a bear that's been mauling people and Eggles, oh, I just saw the bear, it was over there. And then he goes and hides where the bear was gonna be. But while we have other characters who are identified as being berserks or uh, his grandfather who was known as Nightwolf, as we have these other characters who, who have that attribute you know, to, um, described, it's never really specified throughout this portion so far that Eggel has that, has that ability. And so I think it's interesting to, to consider that side of Egil, that, that side of his development as a character. Um, and we see it right at the end of this week's reading when Egil goes and decides almost randomly to just defend a, a family against this incredibly unpleasant berserker, sort of a, a, a sort of, um, you know, other side of the coin of Egil with this, this man who is a berserker from Sweden and who has just been killing people left and right and now is going to kill uh, a young man in a duel. And Egil says, I'll, I'll take on this. So we have this passage. Then Lot arrived with his party and made ready for the duel. He carried a shield and a sword. He was a very big, strong looking man. When he came to the dueling area, the berserk fury came over him and he began howling horribly and biting his shield. Fridgir was not a big man. He was slender and good looking but far from strong, and he had never been in a battle. When Egil saw Lyot, 
he uttered a verse. Fridgir is sure to fail, so friends, let us fight and guard the young girl against this maniac, this violent Valkyrie maddened shield swallowing villain. The glaring god feaster goes to his own death. <laughs> and so Eggle suddenly is going to step up and defend somebody else. He's not the one starting the fight this time. Uh, he's not the one who's taunting everybody and creating the fight. And he even doesn't even really taunt the, this Lyot character. He allows that character to taunt him and then says, well, I gotta, I, it's not fair to refuse his request. I'm gonna go fight him. Lyot now entered the arena and they charged at one another. Eggle swung at Lyot and Lyot parried the blow with his shield. But Eggle struck a blow after blow so that Lyot was unable to strike back. He gave ground to make room to strike, but Ego went after him just as quickly, pounding at him furiously. Lyot went outside the circle of stones and all over the metal. meadow. The fight went on like this until Lyot asked for a rest, and Ego allowed that. They stopped for a rest, and Ego uttered a verse. I feel this flashing swordsman falls back when I force him. He is afraid, this unfortunate overfed fighter. The blood-sucking battler backs away from my blows and beats a retreat from the bald-headed bard. <laughs> it's sort of wonderful that uh, Egil is willing to like mock his own baldness um, and uh, within this. And notice that he's he he says you know unpleasant things about Lot, but he's not like shouting them at Lot. He almost seems to be saying it to to his side around him. Um, and and there, there's less of the taunting. Uh, there's this irony even again about when he refers to himself. And so Egil's poetry is one of the places where I really noticed he, it seemed like he was changing as a character across this portion of the novel. Um, the saga, I should say. Uh, we do have numerous historical references across this one. So we had spent time in Norway. We had heard about King Harald unifying Norway and how despotic that had really become. We had uh, learned a little bit about the colonization of Iceland, the early settlers uh, landing there in Iceland. And now we get more, we have some raids, we get to Denmark, we make it over to England, uh, where we're in Northumbria and York, where we meet King Ethelstan, uh, grandson of Alfred the Great, and uh, Egil in the great tradition of the Vikings who would form the Varangian Guard and, and such uh, in Europe. is, of course, one of Ethelstan's best commanders. Unfortunately, his brother Thorolf loses his life in battle, and my folio said had a cool illustration from that of his burial. Uh, so he, he loses his brother, and this, that uh, ultimately allows Egil to marry. He marries Asgard, his former sister-in-law. Itself an interesting dynamic where Egil wants to get married, and no nobody really wants to approve it, but they they circle around and finally go, okay, okay, okay. Uh, but again, that part is interesting because Egil, uh, we, we get Egil sharing poetry about his frustration and about um, feeling saddened that, uh, that this is taking so long. And so again, the poetry reveals the change in Egil, not just his actions, not just his, um, his, his choices as a warrior or his war, um, uh, but the, it's really his words that lend, um, that give shape to that change. And I just found that really fascinating across this portion of the saga. Uh, we see, we, we had seen sort of this parallel of the Thorolfs. So Egil has a brother Thorolf who dies in battle defending King Ethelstan. Um, Egil's uncle was Thorolf, who along with Grimm, later Skallagrim, Egil's father, uh, they had sort of, they were both potentially good warriors, but Thorolf was the one who went and across that, that first week's reading was this great hero, he was very skilled, and was ultimately betrayed and, and murdered. Um, and so we've, we've lost both Thorolfs, but it's interesting to compare the ideas of kingship, I think, across this portion of the saga. Because we had King Harald, who was very violent and despotic. We've had King Eric, and Eric sort of gets a, a, a soft pass, I think, from, from the uh, composer of this saga, because Queen Gunhild, um, you know, seems to be the one who really has it out for Egil. Uh, her, her brothers are sent to kill him. Um, and, she, and she's always, he, Eric is sometimes willing to perhaps let Egil off a little bit more lightly, and then Queen Gunhild is furious and wants Egil killed right there on the spot. But Eric himself is, is not a, a particularly good ruler. He's not a good example of a king. And so it's been interesting to see that uh, contrasted with King Ethelstan in England and how in some ways King Ethelstan seems to have success. Even the King of Denmark seems to uh, get along with Egil better than the various Norwegian kings have. Uh, we'll see how things transpire with King Hakon across this final portion of the saga. But um, I'm really enjoying it. I, I've enjoyed seeing 
what feels, like I said, like we have a character in a novel now who's shifting and changing and growing and um, experiencing different emotions and, and not just having all of that forced upon him. So I'd be happy to know your thoughts, learn what you're finding uh, within this saga, but I'm certainly enjoying it. And I'll look forward to closing it out uh, across this next week. And uh, as I mentioned, I find Egil as a character is really interesting and that's true for uh, a number of the sagas. There are, there are other sagas that have really interesting, fascinating characters, Gunlock's Serpent Tongue, even um, the, the short tail Aden of the Western Fords is very effective. Uh, but I think it's particularly noticeable when it's compared to sort of the family sagas that exist. So we've had Egil's saga and, and he's really a key part of it now that we're deeper into the saga. It is, we have his immediate ancestors, but we're not going back for Five, four or five generations. Um, Njal's saga was a little bit closer to that as well, where it was really just a few generations that, that the saga focused on. But there are other sagas, like the Laxdalar saga and some of the others, that, that are long sagas and really do seem to have um, a much larger cast of characters and, and don't necessarily develop the depth that we find here with Egil. I had mentioned as well a contrast to some of the um, epics, works like the Nibelung Genlai or uh, Beowulf. Um, I was thinking uh, as well in prose of the uh, quest for the Holy Grail portion of the um, Lancelot, Lancelot Grail cycle. But I think it, the, the, those are such archetypes. They, they represent some symbol. And so every choice is guided by who, what they, the idea they represent, the paragon they represent, the virtue or vice they represent as a symbol, not who they are as, as a person. Um, we did get some cool historical mentions. And there was, of course, mentions about the Orkneys. So for those who are interested, there is an Orkneyinga saga, the sagas of the Earls of Orkney, uh, which is kind of interesting. And, and then I had mentioned the idea that the Egil saga could be part of that tradition of the novel. And that's an argument that Stephen Moore makes in his book, The Novel, Beginnings to 1600, where he has an entire uh, sort of like section chapter devoted to the Icelandic sagas, Egil being one of the ones he spends a lot of time writing about and Njals being another. So um, those are some works I was reminded of. Oh, I should add, with King Ethelstan and the references to Alfred the Great, it would also be great uh, to dive into the um, the Saxon tales, Saxon lords, uh, novels that Bernard Cornwall wrote. Um, Sword Song is one of the later ones. Uh, the Last Kingdom. The, the, the early ones deal with Alfred um, and Uhtred as, as one of this, this boy growing up in Alfred's court and ultimately a, a warrior in general for Alfred. But later on, Alfred's heirs and heiresses. And, and uh, fighting on their behalf in the Saxon kingdoms. And so that would be a little bit closer to where we were with Egil's saga. But again, I hope everybody enjoyed this passage and I look forward to closing out Sagalong next week. Thank you.